So, uh, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Um, good afternoon, guys. Uh, welcome to another episode of Extra Bytes. And uh, today is special. And um, as I was mentioning in my whatever sharing that I was doing on WhatsApp and Facebook as well, that we have a special Sunday blockbuster coming up today. And I think it is not going to be anything less than that. Uh, because... Uh, Today, we have a very special uh, guest and speaker uh, who is a wildlife photographer and uh, something very unique uh, with him because that is what I felt and what, what I shared with everybody. And let me say it again that today, wildlife photography as an arena is really overcrowded and everybody who is trying to get into photography as a hobby is trying to experiment with wildlife photography. And it is very difficult to make a mark for yourself. And this is where um, so our guest and speaker today, Gurcharan Rupra, has really made a mark in a very short span of time. And uh, just to give a very brief introduction, because um, um, it's not my show, it is his show, so he will give a detailed um, uh, introduction later on. Um, so he, is, he is, uh, was born and brought up in Nairobi and... Um, he is an automotive engineer by education. He worked in uh, UK for almost 10 years. Uh, but since he was very uh, keen on wildlife conservation or something like that, and then that love for that actually brought him back to uh, his roots, Nairobi. And somewhere in between or during that time, he started joining two things together, his um, love for wildlife and his hobby as a photographer um, hobby as a photography and and then he became wildlife photographer and the kind of work that he creates is phenomenal because uh, it looks fine artish it looks um, it looks very very intimate at times um, I I when, when I was looking at his images I almost felt that he's trying to get into the the face and the mouth and the nose and everything of, of the animal and uh, and still still keeping uh, those storytelling um, kind of characteristic of his wildlife images intact so uh, without further um, further uh, delay let me welcome you uh, gurcharan rupa and thank you for accepting our invite to be um, sharing to share your uh, thoughts, your, your journey, your wonderful work. It's very difficult to find out uh, uh, the favorite work from your uh, set of images that you have created. So welcome um, uh, to this session of Extra Bytes. And we have two panelists, Prakash Kumar Singh, who's joining us from Dubai, and Sandeep Mathur. So um, my first question to you, um, is that uh, you you came back from UK for your love of photography or your, for your love of wildlife conservation or you just had to come and you started picking up these things? Hello, everybody. I came back for the love of money and better life. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for sure, you know, uh, the reason we went to UK was obviously economy or economic issues or whatever the case is. So we went for that reason. Uh, coming back to Kenya was again brought back by the same reason where, um, whereas in the UK I was working in Kenya, now we have, uh, I have my own business with my family, with my dad and my brother. And that's the reason I moved back to Kenya to come and join the business. And this started off as uh, passing time 
photography was let's go and pass time over the weekend rather than sitting and doing nothing at home or whatever the case was. And uh, I'll show you the photos and see where it's taken me. I've moved, been back in Kenya now eight years. So in the last eight years, you will see from where, where, where I've reached to today. And it's, again, another testament of saying, you know, we've got spare time. We enjoy watching a lot of TV. Uh, Netflix these days has taken over my life in the lockdown. <laughs> but <laughs> photography is still a big hobby. And the reason why it's like this is because I've invested a lot of time into photography. And that investment in time is what you're seeing today. All yeah. right. I think that is what you just said is uh, something very, very amazing that investment in time. And, and I think yeah. that is the key, which most people don't understand. Now, uh, my, uh, I'm, I'm curious to know that you live in Nairobi. Do you yes. live somewhere near, closer to the park, National Park? Nairobi National Park, the entrance is four kilometers from my office. Oh. Yeah, so it is literally behind my office. Yeah. That is amazing. And, and uh, so it's, I, do you find it a huge advantage um, in terms of your photography uh, being... Uh, absolutely. Posted? Yeah, absolutely. Not only being an advantage, but being the inspiration to my photography. You know, if it wasn't there, then I would only get, you know, very limited opportunities to go out and photograph. Whereas in Nairobi National Park, uh, I can see that, oh, look, today there's a thunderstorm coming in. Yeah, guys, 4.30, I'm out of here. Yeah? And I'm into the park <laughs> and I'm going to go do my sunset there. And there are shots that I've got that I've featured in the presentation that literally have come from situations like that. It's like, guys, there's a thunderstorm coming. I need to go. Yeah, and I'm going to go and go and get it done. That's, that's great. But is there any disadvantage as well? Uh, the disadvantage... I don't think so, because, huh? you know, you, you go and you sit in traffic going home every day and you get more and more frustrated with all these crazy drivers around you. But you go into Nairobi National Park and that frustration is gone as soon as you pass through that gate. You're suddenly into wilderness, you're into landscapes, you're into wildlife. It completely changes how your day was to how your day is. Yeah, You know, we're all busy at the office. You know, there's no lying that you know we've got very very frustrating work lives we've got a lot of pressure on ourselves and then all of a sudden things change and here we are today and you, you know my, my biggest everyone asks me about going to the park and I say the first thing you know photography important because a lot of wildlife photographers go there with the pressure to go and achieve shots and the biggest thing for me is no I'm going into the park first of all to get my mind cleared to go and find peace within myself. And that peace within myself and an animal is where the photography comes in. So it's not about being pressurized, not about that I must nail a shot. It's about going there, enjoying wildlife. And when you enjoy something, the photos will just come themselves. They honestly will come themselves. I'm no photographer, I'm an engineer. And this is just a hobby that's turned into wages today. That's wonderful. You, you, you say that these four kilometers, you find a lot of traffic. Um, did you ever find um, in this traffic that the wild human beings create some innocent wildlife uh, getting lost on the streets as well, like getting lost their way? And have you ever seen that? Or does it happen? You YouTube videos and you'll find lions on our highways, huh? <laughs> like how you have in India with gear, yeah? So you do, we do get that. You do have, um, on the back of the park, there's a lot of residences and businesses that are coming up. And, you know, um, a lot of people say our dogs get taken by leopards. So all that, yes, you know, there is human wildlife conflict like everywhere in the world. But we as a human, or should I say as a species, should find a way to work together or at least find a way where we can live together in some sort of harmony and not in a way where we are trying to kill, hurt, or whatever we're trying to do to each other. Yeah. That's interesting. So, uh, uh, Gurcha, I have a question for you. Um, sure. for, for us who've never been to Nairobi or to Kenya, uh, please um, uh, correct our, our thought process. So 
it's not as if that you just enter the gates of Nairobi National Park, you're going to see the lions and cheetahs. Sometimes I think um, you spend days and not see anything. Am I right in this notion? Uh, I, I would like to say you're right. Um, Nairobi National Park, yes, it's right on the boundary of the city. Yeah, you can drive. We have a bypass that um, goes along the fence of the park and you can drive on that fence and you can see rhinos, you can see giraffes, you can see buffaloes, you can see all sorts of antelope. On a lucky day, you might even see a lion. You know, okay. so uh, opportunity, you know, we, all of us who have been on safaris know or should understand the fact that yeah, you're going to get into the park and it's not a guarantee you're going to see a lion. It's not a guarantee you're going to see a cheetah or a leopard. I mean, yes, we have, I have a record of at least seven leopards in Nairobi National Park as it stands today. But trying to see them might be once a month, might be once every three months. We have a record of about 40 lions in Nairobi National Park, which are much more easier to see. Yeah, cheetahs, are even harder than leopards in Nairobi National Park. But yeah, you go into Masai Mara, which is around three and a half hours from me, and there, you know, the abundance of cats is so beautiful with Mara. But then you've got other parks where you've got Amboseli, where the abundance is elephants and not cats. And you can go into Northern Kenya, into Samburu, where again, the abundance is different. So it's not a guarantee. You come with your own luck, your luck might mean that you could go to 50 parks in the country and not see anything. You know what I mean? But then you get the other guy who comes in with the luck hat. As soon as he crosses the gate, the first thing you see is a lion. Yeah. And you tell those guys, guys, this is not common. So please don't get used to this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. So we, we'll, we are already itching to know your uh, life journey and how did you pick up photography and... Um, uh, we might know that uh, probably we can have a wild guess as to why wildlife photography, but still, uh, <laughs> we would like to hear from you and would sure. like to see your wonderful images and maybe some interesting stories behind them. So, Absolutely. That, that's how I like to do my presentations. Yeah. Uh, just for guys who are there now, it's going to be a little, the first part is going to be boring where I talk about myself. I don't enjoy that but you need guys ask those questions. So we'll talk about who, uh, where, how, where I came from, my photography. Then we'll go into the overview and the different genres of photography that I do. And we'll start going through the photos. Uh, every photo will have its EXIF data on it. So that will help you guys or help the guys out there. And then towards the end of a particular genre, I will show how I took the photos. All right, so ready to start? You give me yes. the go ahead. Yeah. Right. All right, cool. All right, let me go here and I'm going to do a screen share and taking over, guys. All right. And yeah. here we go. Thanks, guys. Um, nice to see you. Oh, normally I like the presentation part where I can see what's coming next. So it feels like I know I'm in control, but today I'll have to go with whatever we're seeing here. Um, it, it's basically talking about a different perspective because I like to tell stories with my pictures, like the key picture at the back here. We've got the rain, we've got the eland, we've got the birds flying, we've got the sun setting, we've got dramatic skies above. So it's something I really, really love doing. And we're going to try and follow that perspective as we go through. So well, I'm uh, born in Nairobi, Kenya. I studied automotive engineering uh, I've got a bachelor's in automotive engineering. Um, I then came back to Kenya, lived a couple of years here before I moved back into the UK where I went and uh, as you move up, uh, became a project manager in the construction industry. Uh, currently, uh, then I moved back to Kenya in 2012 and I joined up as a director in Rock Plant East Africa. We do construction equipment and transport services around through East Africa. And uh, believe it or not, uh, it is a weekend hobby. I'm an inspiring photographer over the weekend. And it literally is that. It's not a full-time career. It's not a full-time job for me. It is a weekend hobby. And then uh, let's talk about uh, photography. Um, how did I get into it? It was something I always enjoyed. Um, I used to... We, we, we have a... I don't know if you know Kenya, but there's always the safari rally. 
and we had this motorsport event here, which was part of the international championship. And that was still is a very big scene around here. And that's where photography started. My uncle used to have a film SLR that I used to borrow from him. And I used to go out and take rally photo photos with him. And that was, ooh, I can take some photos or maybe my compositions were good in those sort of days. Uh, from that, um, I moved to the UK where it completely died because the importance was trying to earn money at that point. Uh, it's still, obviously, earning money is still very important because we have to pay for all these fancy places we want to go to these days. Um, it became serious around four years ago where I started realizing that I have a knack for it. Um, I can go out and I can get good shots on even shorter trips. And from that, uh, in the process, you know, I started off with a Nikon D50. From the Nikon D50, I moved to the Nikon D90. From the D90, I moved to the D7000. Uh, that's probably where I made the mistake. From Rather than from the 90 to move to the 7000, I should have gone to a pro, or should I say should, to an FX camera. But anyway, thankfully, I only lost one camera in the move. Uh, then from the D7000, I went and bought a D4, and that's where I realized I made the mistake. And from the D4, I went to the D4S. From the D4S, I went to the uh, D5, and now you can see that I own a D5, a D850, a Z7 as well. Uh, I did do a pre-production advertisement video for Nikon that we used. Uh, it was available on my website. The easiest or the quickest way to see it is on my website. The links will follow towards the end. Uh, currently, Nikon have handed me a D6, and I'm trying to do content creation with a D6, so I'm enjoying, I'm having fun. Uh, lenses, my favorite, or should I say my was, I still use it a lot, is the 200-400. Uh, the 1424 for my astrophotography and extreme wide angle. The 2470, which I use every park trip, it's a very key lens to me. The 7200 I have, but it stays in a box uh, most of the time. A 20 millimeter f1.8, yeah, I know it's wildlife photography, but yes, by 20 millimeter is probably my most craziest used. It's been bit, it's got all sorts of uh, stories it can tell if it had to. And the 1430 with the Z series and again my we get to it but my trap camera these days has become the z7 and that was the idea behind it with nikon uh this is how i'm going to break down my slideshow i'm going to talk about my telephoto photography first which every wildlife photographer believes is the most important lens in the wildlife photography kit but the idea now behind the rest of them is to try and get you guys to understand or get everybody there saying that the stories are better told with wide angle. So we'll talk about wide angle, then we'll go to ground level photography, then to aerial photography, and towards the end, we'll be talking about settings or the settings I work with, and also how I edit my photos. It's not gonna be very descriptive or we're not gonna go into Lightroom, but it's just gonna show you that this is the start product and this is the end product, where we can achieve or where we can go. So if you've got old photos, you didn't take them right, let's try and see if you can reutilize them, yeah? Uh, so without further yeah. ado, yeah. let's get into telephoto photos, yeah? Here we go. Typical telephoto, you know, eyes blazing at you, yeah? yeah. Lioness looking at me. Uh, you can see the EXIF data on the top. Let me move my... Yeah. Uh, oops, I can't see. Oh, there we go. I can move it there. I just wanted to move it so I can read it myself. Yeah, there we go. So we've got the EXIF data, typical wide angle F4. I want short depth of field because I want everything to be about her eyes. There's two flies on her eyes. You can see each eye has a couple of flies on it. Uh, ISO 800, 400 millimeter. Yeah, very telephoto. Oh, yeah. Oh didn't let me click there we go again telephoto this is probably one of the most famous lines in the world he's called scarface you can see his uh from our side the left eye is damaged yeah he's got an injury on his left eye if you go and google scarface you will find 
unlimited images about this guy. I wanted to do something different. I love my high key imagery at the moment. Here it is. I love his mane. The wind was blowing it. You, you know, you have to always find ways of telling stories with wildlife because the hardest part of our wildlife is you don't know what the animal is going to do next. And that's probably the biggest issue. And for sure, you can't tell the animal to do something. Huh? He's not going to understand you. Uh, again, early mornings in the park. You know, this is, for, for me, I must, if I'm going to the Mara, I'm going to go and spend uh, maybe, I, I, I try and go for longer than shorter. I try and avoid two night trips to the Mara. I'll try and go and do one week, two week uh, trips to the Mara. And there is no time I will sleep in. You know, I must wake up at five o'clock every day because by 5.30, by six, I want to be on the road. I want to go there and try and find something. You know, it's not often you find the lion on the horizon where you can go lower than the lion with the sunrise at the same time. Yeah, ISO settings are, oh, sorry, so say EXIF data is all there, but going through. And then slow shutter speed. You know, it takes a while to understand this. It takes a while to get, get it right, but you can see 1 13th of a second I've dropped the ISO when the light drops. Uh, as wildlife photographers, what a lot of us tend to do is uh, when the light drops, we lift our ISO to crazy numbers. Yes, these days equipment can handle, you know, my D5 can handle crazy levels of ISO. However, photography is an art, not a technicality. So let's forget about technicalities. Let's forget Kayara. I need at least minimum, you know, I'm on a 400 millimeter lens. I need 400 millimeter or one four hundredth of a second, which is what I would use generally to make sure it's stable. But light has dropped. If I went for one four hundredth of a second, I might have been sitting at 10,000 ISO for this. But that's not what photography is. Photography is an art. The craft is trying to understand the camera and the camera details. But then it also is an art. And when we're trying to push an art, try and make something artistic. I'll go through with more of these artistic shots as well. Yeah, one thirteenth of a second. For sure, I can't hold a camera stable, but these baboons were trying to jump over a little gully and I was there prepared for it. Yeah, again, you know, I love this getting low down, lying down, uh, when I get back to the lodge some days, I'm even more dirtier than you could say the animals that stay there. But make sure you do it where you're allowed to do it. Please don't break rules. Don't get caught and don't get yourself in trouble. And definitely don't get yourself, don't put an animal in trouble that attacks you. You know That's the key for me as well. Making sure you don't hurt the animals. But here we go. This is uh, Northern Kenya, black rhino, uh, still cloud cover above the sun trying to sort of uh, sunrise and here we're going, you know, next shot, telephoto. Yeah, trying to get a very shallow depth of field. So the eye is in focus, the nose is out of focus, the back is out of focus. It was a male lion. You can kind of see the main, yeah, 400 millimeter, uh, one four hundredth of a second to try and get stability. That That's usually my typical... Should I say, if I'm got a 400, if I'm zooming out to 400 millimeter, I'll try and keep minimum shutter speed one four hundredth of a second. Yeah, unless I'm trying to be creative, then I'll start moving forward with different shutter speeds. Uh, still going. Here we go. Uh, a lot of people don't get this straight away. You know, one of my friends called me and said, "Hey, Gucci, I think your camera sensor is dirty because on the left hand side on the top you can see all the dots, and those are not dots; those are." flies sitting on the water surface. If you look carefully, it's a reflection. You've got the original cheetah at the bottom. I've turned the shot upside down and it's a reflection. You can see one water droplet just above on the cheetah's back. Yeah. This, Again, is, uh, this is one amazing what? photograph um, has been liked by almost everybody. Is there some story behind this or? Uh, Obviously, you know, this is, uh, if many people have, uh, or guys who follow Mara, this is one of the five brothers, you know, the five cheetah brothers. There are not yes. many known coalitions of, I think you've got three brothers and two brothers, and then they've joined to form a coalition of five. 
this is one of the five. And we started off early in the morning. Usually you'll find that first thing in the morning, the weather is very calm. The wind is very still. This is what was happening on this particular day. It was very still. It was very calm. And I was really, really lucky to get this sort of shot. And I was with a couple of photographers. Uh, we took the shot. I saw it. I zoomed. I turned my camera upside down and I went to all my friends there in the vehicle with me. And I said, guys, this is how I'm going to post it. Uh, one of them even went to the effect of saying, you're crazy. This will never work. But this shot was liked by so many of my peers who I respect in wildlife photography. And, you know, many of them have commented, we've discussed this shot. You know, it's one of the situations you get lucky. The weather holds and the animal holds. You know, the subject works, the weather works, the conditions work. You are in the right place. You know, there's a lot of variables in wildlife photography. And this is one of those days where the wild variables came together. I will discuss the editing on this shot towards the end of this uh, workshop and we'll go to the end and we'll discuss it and we'll show you what I did and how it started off. Yeah, so we'll get back to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, here I was with an elephant in Amboseli. Uh, I saw the fish eagle in the ground. <laughs> I forgot about the elephant. I was uh, as low down as I could get. Uh, fish eagle started flying across. There's a rainbow in the back. You know, thankfully, we've got these machine guns that can do 14 frames a second. And, you know, you wait for the right time to start and you start, ta -ta 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 -ta, and here's the shot, yeah? Love it. Uh, there's a little bit of rain in the background as well. You can kind of see it on the elephant. Uh, you might not see it depending on the screen size you're using. But, you know, I saw the... The plan was the bird in this case, and I wanted to get the bird sharp, so I moved my shutter speed to one eight hundredth of a second while still maintaining my 400 millimeter zoom. Uh, going forward, again, trying to be creative, low shutter speeds, leopards, overexpose it, one sixth of a second in this case. You know, trying to keep your ISO down as well when the light drops. It's not one of my best and my favorites, but it's just to try and show you guys out there that, yeah, you can do so much. You know, it's not all about everything must be frozen. Try and get a story behind it. And here is a big example of it. On this particular day, the light was so low. I think we started off at around 5.30. We came across these uh, elephants on the horizon by around 6, 6.15. The sun hadn't risen, and the idea here for me was one second. I wanted to get one second. I wanted to get uh, more depth of field. Not that it mattered. It probably didn't matter even if I went with F4. And literally, you know, I was now taking the shot and moving the camera across. R one second. So the elephants weren't moving fast enough, but I was the one moving the camera to get these trails behind the elephants to try and make this work. And that's where this shot happened. So again, now when we come into telephoto lenses, stability is always a big issue for us. You know, we're trying to pick up a telephoto. It's 400 millimeters. It's heavy. Uh, what do you do? Yeah, we'll get to that. Uh, focal length is a big key. And, you know, if you're using a 600 millimeter lens, I would say one six fortieth of a second would be the slowest I would go if I'm hand holding it. Yeah, for sure. I'm trying to break that balance from everybody. But initially, when you're still trying to get into it, you know, what I try and do is the first shot I'll always take is I'll take it at optimum for sharpness. And then I'll start playing around with settings to try and manipulate. Yeah. So I'll always go one four hundred, and definitely, you know, compensating. How do you work around it? What do you do? Yeah, it'll, it'll all come. And, you, you know, this is how you slowly and steadily practice makes perfect. You know, compensation is all done through practice. Yeah. And uh, this is what I use. I used to use very regular, I used to use the Apex beanbag with a mount and a gimbal on it. Yeah, and I have a GIMPRO attachment for my vehicle and I mount it so the GIMPRO allows me to use lower shutter speeds than I would have. Hey, 
a simple bean bag without even the gimbal head will work perfectly fine. I use it so often these days. Yeah. Uh, moving on to focus. You know, this is where we're saying, how do we compensate? I tend to use, uh, depending on the situation you're in, normally I use single point focus. Uh, I might use single point servo uh, in the case of where there's grass in the front of the scene. So when you've got grass in the front of the scene, if you've got continuous uh, focus, you, you'll find that it's constantly jumping. You know, your lens tries to jump onto the grass, onto one blade, the second blade, you know, you're constantly jumping. So at that point, I'll be using a uh, single or AFC where I know that the subject is walking towards me or the lion's moving or it's a hunt, they're running across. That's where I'll use uh, AFC or AFS. 99 or 90% of the time I'll be on AFC and AFS where I'm struggling to get uh, focused, so then I'll use that one. Uh, this should terminate, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, here we go. I'll just drive along. Uh, ISO, automatic or manual? A lot of people ask me that question. I will always go first in automatic. As I said, you take one shot, you get it sharp. The reason I go automatic is imagine that day you're driving back to camp and as you're getting closer and closer to camp, suddenly the light is dropping. This one leopard jumps out of the bush and runs across the vehicle. You had just enough time to pick up the camera and you don't know what settings it was, you shot photos. That's yeah. where I'd say automatic because what you want to do is you want to have your camera on this optimum setting that you know that no matter what happens, sometimes things happen in the wild and you don't know what happened or you don't know where it came from, but you just had enough time to pick up the camera and do something. Get that one shot at least. You know, get into automatic ISO, you know, get into shutter priority. The reason I like shutter priority is if the shutter speed is not fast and you know it's not fast or you're in that situation where the light has dropped so much that the automatic you, you know what I mean? It's so slow. You, your thumb, all you have to do on the Nikons is just roll to the left and go somewhere and the shutter speed will automatically go fast. You know what I mean? Or bring it back down. You don't have to think about what the speed is going to be. Just one turn or two turns will get you somewhere or vice versa. So initially, at least you'll get that shot and there's nothing more amazing going back to the camp with your chest all out and, you know, your I saw a leopard and I got a shot. It's crazy I saw, but I got a shot. You know, guys, look at this, look at this. You'll get it. But when you have time, then start going to manual. Take it into where you feel is your optimum or what you want to achieve in respect of your composition, in respect of your artistic talent. Don't always forget that you want your artistic talent to come out. That's what we're looking for. It's art. So we're going to talk about uh, moving on to wide-angle photos. And the yeah. first photo I start with is going to be a telephoto photo, but it's to tell the story why, yeah? Yeah. Um, I have a question. When, when I go through your website, um, so my question is totally unrelated to what you've shared till now. Uh, yeah. Not that it's not good. It, it's uh, outstanding. Um, there are, there are three different um, segmentation there. So one is aerial photography. One is ground level photography. And yes. then you decide that, no, you need to show some wildlife photography as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what are those aerial and ground level? You don't consider it's, them? It's, no, no, no. It's not that I don't consider them wildlife photography, but the reason I, you see, then I'd have to put a fourth category talking about telephoto and wide angle. Whereas, Wide angle also covers in the ground photography. So I decided saying, okay, let me go with telephoto photography as my wildlife photography, and then let's go to ground level and let's go to aerial photography. Because aerial photography, a lot of it is birds for me. Yeah. 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 But it's still wildlife. You know, like yeah. putting over overall, I am a wildlife photographer and I don't really do uh, other genres. And the rule is that if it has a tail, I will photograph. If it doesn't have a tail, I'm not photographing it. Yeah. That's my rule, and that's the reason it was. Yeah. All right. And and coming to your uh, the images that you shared, your telephoto, and uh, so my question is that you shoot in an in a location 
in an environment where wildlife just happens to you even when you don't want to do it the moment you enter yeah. something or the other will be there unlike indian wildlife scenario where you will really have to hunt them to figure out how to get to sight some animal other than langurs and all so uh, okay. how do you find um, telephoto still being very very useful to you especially the, with the kind of photography that you do the varied kind of photography you do you know every situation demands its lens it's not a matter of you know i i don't go one day saying today i am only doing telephoto I, I will go there every day with, or whenever I'm in the park with my 204, 200, 400 connected to my D5, my 2470 connected to my D850, and then my uh, Z7 with the 1430 connected into the trap. So you know, like these are the three that I will travel with at every trip, and everything ready, batteries charged, camera cards empty, everything ready to go. So I will come up to a situation or, as you say, abundance. Yes, Masai Mara for sure is the one place in the world where, should I say, the, or should I say the population of wildlife per square kilometer is the highest in the world. And it has its beautiful advantages. And when the migration comes in, it's even more crazy. Nairobi National Park isn't as beautiful, or hasn't got that sort of population like Masai Mara. But, you know, another you you have to think about and i'm sure a lot of indian photographers do this as well in india is okay we are in the dry season where are we going to find the animals close to water holes so you plan your photography okay now it's uh, we've got a lot of rain okay i know this location where it the this particular place if i find an animal at it i'll get these beautiful landscapes with the clouds and the rain in the background rather than going into the bush and saying okay it's raining it's in the bush what am i going to photograph you know i'll go out into the open plains in the rainy days but saying that i enjoy my open plains way more than i enjoy my bush yeah or should i say deep into the bush where we're constantly looking for the leopard or something like that i enjoy my open plains more yeah all right yeah Uh, there's one interesting question that has come on youtube uh, by yogesh bhatia so he's asking that is it possible lying down on the ground by coming out of the vehicle in mara uh not in the mara itself but you have the greater mara which is conservancy so you've got uh, olare motorogi you've got mara north uh, mara triangle don't allow it olare motorogi allow it uh, mara north allows it uh most of my uh should i say my rhino shots are taken in conservancy or not the ones that are not taken in nairobi national park are taken in uh, solio conservancy which has full acceptance so if you want to go into that sort of photography please choose your location where you won't be in trouble for it you know go into olare motorogi you know be very clear with the guide that you're going to go with that this is the type of photography i want so he will plan the locations for you in that respect if you ever came to me said good take me on a trip and i want to go and do low level i want to do this and then i will come back to you and i'll say okay the parks i want to take you at is you know i want to take you to olare motorogi i want to take you to solio you know these places we are allowed to leave the vehicle without breaking the rules of the particular park or conservancy you do it comfortably you do it where the guide is with you and is comfortable with what you are doing as i said first priority animal will not be risked and if you see the risk is less of the animal because a rhino is way stronger than one of us but hmm. if that rhino feels threatened and it comes and attacks you and you get injured in the process the first thing everyone will do is will go and shoot down the rhino and that's not what our interest is because that rhino will suddenly be oh the lion has become a man eater we need to kill this lion that is not our interest our interest is going to be is we are going to first make sure that the animal is in safe or this animal is comfortable um the guide i go to with at solio knows most of these rhinos by individuals and he'll say good this particular rhino you want to go and sit on its back it's fine i'm taking that as a joke it's not real but i'm just trying to exaggerate that the fact that this particular rhino is very comfortable around humans 
So let's go out, scooch, lie down, take your photographs. But then he will look at another rhino and say, okay, this guy, no, 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 no. We're not leaving the vehicle here. And similarly, I've done a lot of work with Ambassadi Trust for Elephants. And those guys have the same motive. You know, we'll go, we went and spent a lot of time with Tim and Tolsoy. And they will do what you want. Come out of the vehicle. We're in a conservancy. We're not in the park. We're not breaking the rules. Do what you want. But then right on the other side, we came across this other big bull elephant. And they're like, hey, this guy has a serious attitude problem. As soon as he's not happy, he will attack the vehicle. So we're going to keep away from him. You know, that knowledge you will not have as an individual or even me. I don't have that knowledge traveling into the Mara because I don't spend so much time there. I don't have that sort of detailed knowledge. So trying to find a guide who has that detailed knowledge is absolutely key. And that's how you work it. So please, yeah, you can do it, not in the Mara, but at other parks. And we can, I can set those locations up, no problem at all. Yeah. All right. Let's move ahead, yeah. Yeah. So be safe. Let the animal be safe as well. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So moving into wide angle. Any more questions before we go into here? Uh, I have one thing. Um, I thought let, let me ask a little later, but it's okay because since we are on this question only, because I've been to Mara. Now we know, um, I know that we can't get down from the car, but there have been a couple of instances. Let us say, for example, specific, going specific when they stop the vehicle for lunch. So they stop yes. at the spot where you get down, you are allowed to get down. Is there, <laughs> is, there risk there? is there any risk there to you from the animal or even to the animal from you? And, uh, and another spot place where you literally are sitting on the ground is uh, where the balloon lands and you are, you are taken to a particular spot. Uh, it appears to be in the middle of the forest, but yes. the first is arranged on the ground and you are sitting on the chairs. Uh, so what is that? Um, are, I, I am totally I am totally with you because how can you be told that you are not allowed to leave your vehicle, but you go into this picnic spot and you're allowed to leave the vehicle. It, it kind of brings in a factor of double standards. Yeah. However, you know, no matter where you are in the wild, you're always at risk. But, but the animals would like to stay away from you more than you would like to stay away from them. So when, you know, I, I have gone with photographers, I've gone with guides who understand, and they'll also tell me, look, okay, good, this particular lion is very calm. If you leave the vehicle, you'll see he'll not do anything. But then you don't know, and the risk is too large. Yep. And, you know, you see all these rangers who walk out on foot. Nairobi National Park has rangers on foot. And you're saying, but you guys are on foot. But let me tell you something. Wear camouflage, step out of the vehicle in front of a lion. That lion will get up and run away. Unless it is trying to defend its cubs or you got it in a bad position where it needs to attack for its defense, nine out of ten times that lion will run away from you. So you go out to some cheetahs and you step out of the vehicle and lie down, you'll find that the cheetah will get up and run away. So you don't want to do that in that respect. But if you go into a conservancy and you want to risk it, you're willing. I mean, you can go into Zimbabwe and do walking safaris. Yeah, you can go into those walking safaris. You can go and find lions in those walking safaris and take your photos by all means where it's allowed to be done. But you don't want to be breaking the rules in Mara just for the sake that you've gone there for one week. You don't want to be in trouble with the rangers and get thrown out two days later. You'll yeah. spoil your trip. It's not, you're not going to spoil their trip. They don't care. You know, they've got millions of visitors with me coming into the Mara every so often, but you don't want to spoil your trip. So consider a conservancy if you want to do that sort of stuff. And coming into wide angle, we're going to talk about other ways of doing, getting out of the vehicle legally. And mm. that's the idea behind this, yeah? Yeah. All right? So cool, getting into it, it's obviously not over. You can still ask questions wherever. Yeah, stop yeah, me yeah. if you need to stop me at any photo, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so here we go. Getting into a telephoto shot. Uh, again, 380 millimeters. We've got this beautiful lion, eye level or slightly above eye level. He's looking at me. I've got this blue sky at the back. Well, not blue. It's a dark, like this rain coming in. 
and you're asking me about uh, Nairobi National Park and this is a day there was a thunderstorm coming in. I said, ooh, the skies are beautiful. Let me go out there. But my 200, 400 did not capture what the environment was showing me. My 2470 did that. This is the same lion. This is the same location. The only difference is that the lion decided to walk. Yeah. So if you look at that black soil, that's the black soil the lion's sitting on. It's the same lion and it is the exact same location. If this does not answer your question, why wildlife? I don't think anything else will ever. Yeah. Right, right, and right. I was so wrong in my settings because I looked at this shot and I was busy taking this, uh, sorry, I was busy taking this lion and I put my camera down to have a look and I realized that it's not capturing the scene. And I quickly dropped my uh, 200, 400 on the seat. I picked up my 2470 and I walked with this guy. I literally walked with this guy and I didn't have my, I just switched on my 24 or my 850 with the 2470 on. I just zoomed to compose and I shot photos, not realizing that it was on F2.8. I wish I'd taken this shot on F4 or F6.3 or even F8, F9, but I didn't. This is the only one I got, or oh, I got them all on 2.8, but the story is told. Yeah, it even went up and it was used as a book cover. This shot was literally used as a book cover for Pause and Trails in Dubai. Yeah. So, Moving on to telling stories. Again, similar situation, Amboseli National Park. Um, you can see the first flamingo way on the right-hand side that had already crossed. So I was driving down this road. Uh, uh, the road is se separate. Uh, in the dry season, this is a dry area. In the wet season, it becomes a swamp. So I am driving along and I see the reflection of the mountain. I was like, ooh, that's beautiful today, isn't it? I'm going to pick up a friend from the airstrip. And I was like, wow, this is so beautiful today. And the first set of flamingos walk past me and I'm looking at myself and I'm saying, wow, this is a photo worth taking. And the flamingos have passed and I was like, damn it, I've missed those. And I see another set of flamingos coming and I don't remember where I parked the car. I don't remember anything. I only remember jumping into the passenger seat and shooting this shot. And you know, I, I have obviously a series of shots because you don't just take one photo with digital these days. I went and I just kept on taking all the shots I could to try and get these. Then a couple of flamingos were flying and they flew across. I've got those as well, but nothing does this scene justice as that particular shot where the flamingos were walking. And then what happened is I didn't realize, but over the last few days that the camera wasn't used, that gathered so much dust, the <laughs> lens was full of dust. I must have spent two hours trying to take out every particle or every spot of dust along this scene. But hey, you know, be prepared. If you're not prepared, that's the consequence you you have to suffer. Yeah. Going on to the next shot. Again, we've got a topi with a topi below it. These topis love uh, standing on these mounds in the Mara. I've always wanted a scene like this. Yeah. Sorry, what did you say? I missed it. Yeah. These topis love standing on the mounds, but you've got one topi and then the second topi within it and also standing on a mound. And then what completes the scene for me is the dramatic sky. Without the sky, the story is slightly yeah. less told, but I love how the dramatic sky came out. Uh, oops, my uh, EXIF data wasn't in the corner, my mis mistake, but I tried F22 so I could get the other topi into... Uh, focus as well. I did 70 millimeter, trying to build up the scene as much as I could build it up. Yeah. But, you know, you're driving across the Mara, but, you know, you're trying to say, you know, the, the feeling I get from you guys is uh, Mara, you know, you don't have to even look for animals. Trust me, you do. If you look at those planes in the background, there's nothing. There's only two topies in this photo. Yeah? Yeah. So you have to, you really, it's not obviously as difficult as India. I totally, totally agree with you guys. Yeah, but our open planes give us the opportunity just to spot items far away. You know, binoculars are so important because you can spot things far away and then drive towards them. That's the advantage we have here. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
moving on again <laughs> same sort of scene you know lioness on a anthill dramatic scene beautiful skies you know i always see myself saying you know i don't see a lot of people having a lot of telephoto photos printed in their house these are the scenes you want to print in museums in galleries you know this is the type of photo to tell a story you know you sit here and you can think oh it was a beautiful sky that day oh look that tree looks beautiful and the lioness looks beautiful as well on the mount you know how often do you get a situation where all these three come together in a yeah uh, like this i have a question uh, good um yeah. is that uh, when did you start experimenting with these wide angle um, lenses for your wildlife or is it right from the beginning or you know later no. like like every person who wants to get into wildlife the first thing you think about is i want to go into wildlife i must get a telephoto mm-hmm. yeah but i'm one of those guys if i do something too often i get bored of it so i totally got bored of wide angle or telephoto photography it doesn't work 100% of the time but it does work 60% of the time and trying to do that all the time one day the the, the, the truth behind it is um i won a competition with nikon and i'd taken a photo of this zebra and nikon had i think if i'm not wrong was a 1000 uh competition winning fees or should i say the the prize money was a thousand dollars but rather than taking money from nikon i decided saying come on guys give me at that time i didn't have a 2470 give me the 2470 2.8 this was the previous version it wasn't even the vr version it's still the previous one yeah and i'm still using it so i bought that lens i tested it i loved it i put it in the cupboard and i forgot it for two years and you know i used to go to the park with my uh, 24 7 sorry my 200 400 on the at that time was the d4s and then i used to have a 70 to 200 on my d4 when light dropped i moved to the 2.8 otherwise it was always a d4s on the 200 400 and then i invested in the d5 but what i learned with the d5 is that it can handle iso so well i was so pleased with it so that what it made me do is where the light would drop i would still use the d5 and not the 70 to 200 on the d4 or the d4s in this case uh i then one day said look this 70 to 200 i'm taking into the park so often but i'm not using it and i'm looking at uh let me try and see if i can do something different so one day i decided to take the 2470 with me uh I'd never used it for about 3 4 trips to the park. Thankfully I can travel every weekend to the park so I used it on maybe 2 3 trips to the park and didn't didn't use it much and then one day this particular scene again dramatic sky animal walking on the horizon came through and I just decided hock it. I can't get the whole scene with the uh, 200 400 let me try and move to the 2470. I moved to the 2470 and I think the stories are told themselves yeah the stories are told themselves i don't really need to talk more about this yeah again you know here's another 2470 shot yeah there's no animal it's just trees an amazing sky half in covered with rain and half not yeah here you could call me a landscape photographer sorry guys no wild animals but it's still <laughs> telling a story yeah it's still the telling sky, a story and i love it the sky looks really wild can i can i ask exactly. you something sure sure you can um for few images i saw you have awesome sky and nice background but why color why black and white i think what black and white does is it kind of you know with color you can tell the distances between the animals whereas in black and white it kind of puts it on a very flat surface it gives you more texture I don't know you know every photo I take these days I will first obviously you see it in color because I took it in color and I will always do a black and white conversion try and work on the black and white scale and then choose what to post and 9 out of 10 times it goes into black and white <laughs> <laughs> but yeah you know like birds birds need color birds you know because of their vivid colors on them they need color to be seen whereas I don't know you know I think landscapes look better in black and white 
not saying that they don't look good in color, but my preference is black and white, if that answers the question, right? Yeah, it's just sure. my artistic touch. I like I like it to be black and white. I good. Think here's color. You, you, just, uh, you know, uh, here's color. You wanted color, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tried this shot in black and white. It didn't work. The reason it didn't like work is because you got this nice big one. Hole. Seriously, yeah? I like this. This shot. is phenomenal. This is absolutely phenomenal. Colors. Really, trust really. Me, I, I, I drove for 20 minutes trying to find an elephant <laughs> or a giraffe with this scene, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> no, this is much better than giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine this with a giraffe, it would have been amazing. Of course. Yeah. Yes, yes. But, but anyway, you know, you make, you know, you are the guy who controls the camera and you have to make the decision. You know, you can see the landscape, you can see the weather, you can see everything. You have to be the person who makes the decision on what you want to do with it. And this is the decision I made saying, look, guys, there's a tree. There's the sky. Let's go to the tree. I've got a 14 millimeter lens on me. Let's go and take that shot. It's probably the only 14 millimeter wide angle shot I've ever taken, but it's done. It's, it's done justice to it. Yeah. Which one question is so high? Uh, I joined. Hi. Hi. Uh, specifically, I was looking. I have. I have seen your portfolio. Um, yeah. Your wide angle shots. Your aerial shots. Uh, they provide a lot of context. Because you're capturing them so wide, right? The the, the dramatic skies and the elements and uh, the habitat of yes. the animals in question. But you know, it was surprising to see that even you have some landscape shots as well, like these. You know, I never anticipated. Yes. Right? So is this is this a genre that you like, but you still probably get swayed towards wildlife because you want some life form in your frames? Uh, but the, the priority for me is always a life form in the frame. I mean, uh, landscapes, who doesn't love that beauty our land has? You know, it's so beautiful. We, half the time, you know, I always like a window seat in the plane because I want to go out there and I want to see those landscapes. I want to see what's happening. You know, those, you, you're flying to India, you've passed through the Himalayan range. You know, it's so beautiful. Who doesn't like that? Yeah. But trying to capture those sort of enlarged frames is so difficult and it's trying to give them justice is so difficult. And, you know, as I said to you, my first preference was I had to go and look for a giraffe or an elephant, but I couldn't find it. So we went for the tree. And this is, I think Mara really does justice to those single trees, especially Maine Mara itself. Yeah, Greater Mara is more difficult with a single tree, but Maine Mara is really, really amazing. Yeah. And yeah, seriously, I, 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 they look like somebody planned them. Uh, they planned and put those trees perfect places. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's mainly down to the soil, and that's what I've worked out. And that's why Mara, when the rainy season is very, very difficult to travel around because of the mud. It's the soil. The soil doesn't allow trees to grow. So you'll just have these particular patches, and that's why you've got these patchy bushes where it allows it. Yeah, the soil just seeps everything, the water goes and it's gone, it's dry, nothing grows in it. Yeah, and that's I, the beauty of the Mara is that very soft flowing landscape with that one tree. And hey, if you can't find a giraffe, you can't find an animal, let's go for the tree, it'll work, I guarantee you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but again, you know, finishing off the question, uh, I love the genre of wildlife landscape only if I can't find a subject. My first preference here would always be an animal. And if I can't find the animal, then I'll definitely go for a tree to try and complete. You know, you, you've got a sky, you don't want to miss this sky. That was the main thing. I mean, five, 10 minutes after this, it rained so heavily, I was drenched. Even with those closed land cruisers, you know, they still leak water. I was drenched on my way back to the lodge. And, you know, we could, thank God the guide knew where he was because I wouldn't have found my way back home. It was that much rain. Yeah. <laughs> Again, you know, going to the next shot, this is another story. Oh, this, this one, this one was a story for me. Yeah. I, I went to a place called Aldonio Bua and the place has one of our, our massive tusker called uh, One Ton. And I spent a couple of days and I looked at the landscape and had this very soft flowing landscape. And 
every morning I spent three nights there, four days. Every morning I would come here and I noticed that the giraffes would go from the forest overnight to a salt lick on the, op- on the left side where they'd go and they'd have uh, the sodium from the ground, the salt. Then every evening they would then return back into the forest to sleep in the forest. Well, I don't know if they sleep or the sand, but they'd, they'd go back to the forest every evening and spend the night foraging in the forest. And this is the, the story behind this. I mean, I was at a lodge and I was spending uh, about $1,500 a night. It was a really, really expensive, you know, my room had its own private pool, but you know, the fool I am, I'm going to spend this money on a lodge and then I go and spend most of my time outside in this place, yeah? But here I was every day, I'm spending at this lodge and I'm thinking I need to get that crazy elephant. But this place made, did so much for me that I spent the next three days trying to get this one shot. And every morning I was trying to get them going across. Every evening I'd try and get them. And they would never come in this sort of... And what I did on this particular day was I told the driver, look, get, let me come out of the vehicle. I was wearing a very green jacket that matched the grass. I covered up my head in a hoodie. The turban is very white and bright. You can't really hide it. So I put the hoodie on and I lied down in about two feet worth of grass. And I told the driver, just leave. I don't want to see you. Just go. Find a place to go. Because what I feel is that when they see the vehicle, they change their direction. So I lied down in the grass. I waited for these giraffes to come. And as soon as I saw what I liked, I stood up and I was like, hi, guys. And I took the shot. And you can see that two are looking straight at me. And they spotted me. And I got this shot. And then the next shot is one giraffe running. And that's the end of the scene. That's amazing. But, yes. but the sky, the giraffe, the flat horizon, it did so much for me that I had to find out. I had to get this shot somehow. Yeah, I really had to get it. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, Just incredible. Typical, typical, typical Mara. You know, Mara. the sun rays are breaking out. The sky is there. We've got that landscape with a couple of animals, but they didn't do justice to the scene as much as the tree did. Yeah. And already you can see, you know, here comes wide angle photography. There's so much more to talk about than telephoto zoom. Yeah, that was a great shot with the lion head on. But look at this. I would love this print in my office so everyone who comes sits and, oh, isn't our world beautiful? Yeah. Beautiful. Again, yeah. F2.2, you know, which crazy guy takes a shot like this F2.2? You make mistakes. But what I'm trying to say in this sort of shots, and I'll keep pushing on this, is it's art about the scene. So don't think too much about settings. Get the scene first. And if you ever get a, the good, the, everything perfect with the wrong settings, you'll kick yourself so hard you'll never make that mistake again. I know a lot of photographers are always thinking what ISO. What aperture? What shutter speed? Forget that. Let the camera do some work. You're spending money on a camera. Let it do some work as well. Yeah. <laughs> let it. You know. <laughs> we don't want the camera to go rusty as well. Yeah? <laughs> Not okay. that it does. Yeah. But I think looking uh, looking at that image, previous one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think um, what Prakash asked uh, about black and white choice of black and white. For me, if I have to, uh, if I look at it as an individual, as an outsider looking at your images, wildlife images. Um, they are um, images especially like these which are minimal in nature and there's a lot of sky and there is one animal and maybe one tree. Um, colors would distract because colors would take it away. My eyes would wander around those black clouds and the blue sky and the green grass probably rather than on the overall feel of the image which is wildlife and the elephant itself. I think black and white in these kinds of scenarios is working perfectly fine for me as an Yeah, Especially, especially with the skies, because you know yeah. when because the, the only color in this photo would have been the green grass. So yeah. when you put this photo into color, the first thing you're always looking at is the grass. Before you go and look at the the, the you know the, the the what I'm trying to show the size of our atmosphere, or should I say uh, the beautiful skies and that one elephant male walking across. Yeah. And one thing I notice again is, and I would like to know your uh, viewpoint on that, um, that all these images, you have uh, composed them 
in center with the animal in the center. So this yeah, one, the same thing. The giraffe one, the tree one, and everything is centered composition. Uh, any particular reason for that? Uh, I love my rule of thirds. I'll either go center this side or that side. I, I like to follow the rule unless the situation is so beautiful that the rule doesn't matter. But 99% of my shots will always have the rule of thirds. Uh, yes, I see the, 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 the shots that I have been showing have been putting the animal in the center. But no, I do. In, in a shot like this, I would always in future prefer to have the elephant on the right third giving more direction or more space in the direction it's traveling. Yeah, and less space from where it's coming from. But I tried that, it would lose, the, the right part of the sky was above the elephant in the middle. So I would lose, you know, this little curve that's happening in the sky. Yeah, that's the reason why I let it stick like this. And the same with the other shot with the tree. Cause I had the 14 millimeter wide angle lens, or should I say the super wide, if I didn't put the tree in the middle, it would be at that funny angle and it yeah, didn't look yeah. nice. Yeah, so on that shot, I did the middle because I didn't want that, uh, should I say the, uh, what's the right word for it? The the way the lens gives that circular and- Distortion. Uh, that, the distortion. distortion, I didn't want the distortion, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you Sandeep. I didn't want the distortion to be, yeah. to come into the photo. I wanted it very nice. Yeah, so it didn't look fake. It looks, you know, you can relate to it better without the distortion. The other thing, Gurj, is uh, with the, such a dominating sky, if you uh, created that space for momentum, I think the sky would have taken away the uh, the, the centerpiece in the image. It, it's probably right. Uh, the, the probable reason that I put it in the center is because I didn't have a choice. Yeah, because <laughs> that's how the shot was taken. So <laughs> that's how it worked. Yeah. That's a good reason. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and later on, you'll also see the reason <laughs> behind all of this stuff. Uh, again, you know, guys who have tried lightning, I tried it on this day. I went for 20 second shutters, uh, low ISO. And now I've bought myself one of those Miops triggers. So yeah. when there is enough light, the camera automatically goes off. But this was, you know, you're just going in loop of 20 second, 20 second shots. And here it is until you get the lightning. Again, Mara, landscape. Uh, I wanted a subject at night. I couldn't leave the lodge to go and find a subject. So I used my subject that I use in the park all the time. Usually I use a Land Rover, but thankfully uh, I've got a Toyota here for the Toyota guys who love Toyota. Yeah? Yeah, but I'm a Land Rover fan. Uh, again, uh, astrophotography, 14 millimeter, helicopter in the scene. Uh, unfortunately, cloud cover, but it still made my shot. I'm happy with the shot the way I got it. Um, the story behind the lens here was crazy. I had to go through about 20 of these guys to reach the helicopter. We were up in Northern Kenya. It, there was so, it was such a big risk at that lodge that the lodge provided UV light. You know, like how you have a torch in your room. They even had UV torches and they said, let's go. We're going to take you out for a walk. We're going to show you what you're looking for. So even at night when you walk out for a week because they didn't have uh, bathrooms inside the rooms, you had to go to like a communal bathroom because it's northern Kenya. Water is a big issue. They were trying to save water as much as they could. We, 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 I, read, I walked through 20 of these scorpions to get to this scene. And even when I was at the scene, I was doing my long shutters. I'm constantly, you know, here we go. <laughs> I'm with the UV torch looking around me, making sure I'm safe. Um, how did I light the chopper up? I took a battery bank, a USB lights, you know, the ones you can put on your laptop for working at night. That's what lit lighting up the chopper in this case. Yeah, but you know, you try and you do different things and you play with it and you go through. Uh, we did an expedition up to Mount Kenya for the sole purpose of getting astrophotography up there. Yeah, so we have the biggest peak, but because I'm so high up, the one nearer to me looks taller. But in the middle, you've got uh, Batian, which is the tallest peak. And then you've got the galactic center. And we had a little... Um, they call them turns up there where you can get the reflection. And it's probably been the hardest photo for me, the most work I've ever done for one photo. Yeah. <laughs> and would I do it again? Nah. <laughs> it was hard work, to be honest with you. <laughs> I keep telling everybody that if I ever do this again, a chopper is going to fly me to the top and drop me up there. Then I'll take the shot. Otherwise, there's no way I'm going up there again. <laughs> yeah. 
So again, let's go into ground level photography. Yeah. This is now the low stuff. I'll go through the photos and then at the end, I'll show you how I took the photos because this is obviously a big one for everybody. Here we go, you know, completely down at the ground. Yeah, we've got <laughs> lipstick. He's called lipstick. One tree, beautiful skies. Typical Mara, you know what I mean? This is what Mara really allows you to do. Yeah. yeah. Again, male, female, uh, low down, beautiful skies. You know, it just does justice to the scene. This frame yeah. is awesome. Yeah, thank you. Same sort of situation, low down, elephant, trying to get as low as I can, clear background with beautiful skies, low down cheetah. Maybe I should have done the edit a bit better. Uh, I love this scene, you know, skies, the elephant family walking on the horizon. I, this is, you know, the situation where you say, I wish I could get out of the car and lie down. And that's the reason behind a lot of what I've done. And you see, yeah, again, elephant low down. I mean, this one has a story in itself. You know, normally you get up to an elephant. The first thing the elephant do is move away from you. But the, 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 the reasoning behind this is you go and spend an hour, you go and spend two hours with that one elephant and that elephant will get so used to, to you or that animal will get so used to you, they'll come, they'll come closer to you. You don't need to go trying to get closer to the elephant. The elephant on its own will come closer. He came close enough that even my guide nearly had his heart in his mouth. He came to maybe around six inches from the car. He walked past that close because he got so comfortable saying that, oh, this guy doesn't mean trouble. He's only got this little device that does all these clicks and is maybe a bit annoying, but yeah, he's okay. He's not causing me any trouble. Yeah. And he got so much more closer. Same elephant again. Yeah. These, Dramatic uh, sky, you know. Yeah. yeah these elephants, um, uh, I've heard a lot of stories because elephants could be very unpredictable and dangerous as well. Un uh, they're more dangerous and unpredictable than even a lion. So uh, I, I, I will totally disagree with that. Okay. Uh, exactly. Read a book. Also, they normally don't attack unless they have cubs between them. You know, read a book called The Elephant Whisperer. This was a okay. guy in South yeah. Africa. He had a, his own lodge and um, he, he owned the conservancy. He got some elephants on it. Just read the book. I won't spoil it for you. And... <laughs> Before, before I had the same attitude like you guys saying elephant, ooh, stay away, stay away, scary stuff, yeah? But ever since reading that book, it, I'm so comfortable with these guys. But sure, a male who is on musk, you can see the temporal gl glands are now excreting. Yeah, definitely stay away from him. But general elephants, as, as long as you're not scaring the babies, you'll be fine, yeah? Here, here's a scene, zebra just given birth. All the vultures are there to pick up the placenta or anything that they can pick up during, you know, any food that they can get. If the little baby doesn't make it, they're ready waiting. But, you know, it's a beautiful scene, low down. Again, I went into black and white because the green grass was distracting the scene. Yeah. Same sort of situation, Nairobi National Park, lion, beautiful skies, low down. And finally, how did I do it? Typical cheapest Nikon nice remote. Monopod down. The reason I bought my D850 because of the flip screen. You flip the screen, you have your live view, uh, you choose your focus point, and there you go. Yeah, and when it's down there, you don't have the choice. So when the shot is animals in the center, it's because I don't have choice now. Huh? I've taken the shot and now that's the shot. We're gonna work with that shot. How simple is this? Every one of us photographers, 99 or 90% of us own monopods. All I'm doing is I'm putting it down on the monopod. If you don't have a gimbal head, put it upside down, turn the photos around in Lightroom later on. That will work fine. If you have, you can get, you know, all this small rig, do these cages around the camera, then put the monopod on the top of the cage, or you can get all these L brackets or whatever you want, you know. It's very, very simple. You just have to think different. That's the main part around this, is what I'm gonna try and encourage is, it's not about, it's still the same Nikon that all of us have. It's about thinking different. That's the deal. Yeah. Again, we're going to go a bit different now. We're still into ground level, but now we're trying to get even closer to the subject. Yeah. Close as possible. Yeah. Wow. Still oh, ground wow. level. Yeah. This is a 20th you know, this is, 
This full frame of a rhino, huh? Uh, yeah, this is 24 mm is amazing. This is 24. Yeah. yeah, I love the 24 mm. Yeah, again, 24 mm. Yeah, good. Uh, just, just one thought uh, just crossed my mind. So, you are putting your camera on a, on a monopod and putting it down. Do these animals uh, notice that? And do they get suspicious of uh, yeah, yeah. your camera? Yeah. Or, so, this one looks so like a charge, right? He's charging. Yeah, if you, if, if, he's not charging. That's the, the idea that looking looking and thinking is... I'll explain it. But uh, yes, the monopod, what you want to do is before you reach the animal, take it out, get it ready, and then approach. So when you approach, the monopod is already down. The animal doesn't see that movement. Yeah? Okay. The comfort level on the animal is already created. In this case, the shutter sound got the animal slightly scared and if you look at the it literally is poo yeah if you look at the poo it's coming forward the animal is not coming towards me the animal is going behind backwards if you look at it carefully it's going backwards yeah. it's not coming towards me yeah okay this one was literally i got it oh, wrong. incredible this was a got it wrong if, if you guys <laughs> use your 2470 you know when you put your lens cap back on yeah. Yeah. On the twenty four seventy, when you put the lens cap, when the when the lens zooms or when when you when the lens physically goes in, it actually zooms out. Yeah. yeah. So I had put the lens cap on so it doesn't get dirty. I quickly found the scene was developing, took it out, put the camera ready, took the shot, brought it back in, looked at it, and I was like, "Oh my God!" It's at fifty five millimeter when I was picking the camera up. Damn it! I hope I got some good shots. And as soon as I went onto the viewfinder to look at what I got, I was in love with this shot. This shot is literally as I shot it. Not cropped. I think maybe the horizon has been straightened ever so slightly, but this is as the shot was shot. Yeah. Good shot. It's How really in the face. Really in the face. Yeah. Oh, Those did you get for the shots? How coming to it. So let me not let me not spoil it yet. Yeah, you're coming to it. I'll show you how I got it. Yeah. Yeah. But percent, again, you know, um, how, how are you managing the focus? Automatic. Choosing okay. a single focus point, putting an automatic and silver. Yeah, okay. it's okay. it works. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. You know, how much more closer can you get? <laughs> you can literally see, you know, even the saliva coming out of his nose. Yeah. And this is how I took them. The same Nikon remote, the camera covered up. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of ghillie suit. You know, when you watch these Navy sniper movies, the snipers wear this suit that looks like grass. Yeah. yeah. It's literally that covered up. And you can see the poo of the, the poo that the rhino was kicking away. You can see the fish eagle on the other side with the camera lying down. And all I've done is I've waited for my moment and I've remotely triggered it. And the sound of the shutter scared the uh, rhino. The rhino jumped or moved backwards. And it's only that little split second. If, if I go back to the, the shot that I took there, I might have got 10 shots with only one shot or two shots of where the action scene is happening of the rhino. Or the other shots are the rhino looking at me and the rhino back into its position still looking at me. Yeah, wondering what was that. Yeah, you know, it's just like, somebody hiding behind the door and as soon as you cross the door he makes a sound and you know you have that momentary what was that you know that was what it is yeah and now the z7 being silent even that factor has gone away now i'm getting even more beautiful shots with more animals without getting those sort of scared here's another i'm going to break the scene again yeah? how i'm going to take the shot look at this i'm under the elephant looking upwards. Would you leave that for the elephant to come and play with it? My insurance policy is strong. <laughs> I've got a good insurance policy on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> but are you, Gooch, are you using a cage or some, some protection for your camera? Coming to it, yeah, coming to okay. it. So on this case, here was this baby elephant came, tried to scare the camera, but the camera's on the ground, I'm far away, he's hearing the clicking, 
He tried to scare it. He tried to scare it. You know how babies like to scare everything. You know, even birds they scare. So the baby tried to scare every uh, the camera. The camera didn't go away. Went back to its mum. Called the mum or went and said something to the mum. So this is communication between elephants. It's so amazing and clear. The mum was far away. She's not even in the scene at the moment, and I'm shooting at 24 millimeter. Yeah. Went to the mum. The mum came running straight to the camera. She didn't go in any direction. She went straight. The first thing she did was she put a foot onto the camera, pressed. Turn the camera around, pressed. Turn the camera around, pressed. Turn the camera downwards, pressed. Turn the camera, pressed. Turn the camera. Do I got this shot? The last shot was her looking down at the camera. Yeah, but just to, and it was so much skill that she knew exactly that she's pressing every corner. It wasn't just a random turn and press. It was literally a very targeted that corner, the other corner. She knew she had tried every corner or every side of that. Yeah, wildebeest running across. Yeah, there is one question. Um... On YouTube, uh, good. By Chintan yeah. is asking that with the new mirrorless camera that that you're using, do you use a silent shutter on them? Yes. Yeah. This shot silent shutter, because this shot was with the D850. It did create some noise, so everyone decided to run across. But this <laughs> is with the silent. Look at it. It's very simple. El buffaloes walk up to it and smell it now, saying. What's this thing? Yeah, it's that good. Yeah, here's a hyena coming to check it out. Here's a lion. Lions, the noise on the shutter is better. Because this lion, you know, like when you're driving on these tracks, you know, you've got the two tracks where the wheel's going. You've got grass in between as well. So the, this lioness was walking on the opposite track. And I saw I'd missed the shot. So I just let off some shutters of nothing. And the lion heard it moved across and walked straight into the camera. Yeah, so with, with, with cats, it's helpful. And then you get oh. even more closer. Yeah, look at this guy. Yeah, big tusker, you know, amazing Mara. This is so Mara and such an amazing tusker, you know? Yeah. That's Here we go, buffalo coming so close to the point where they're now smelling to try and see what's going on. Had I had the D850 in here, the noise, the buffalo would have left by now. But it's coming. It's still having a look. You know, the elephants are there chilling, enjoying, you know. They're, they're typical. They're relaxed about it. Look at this with lions. This is where the noise is. This is the D850. You can see uh, between the legs, there's two more lions. Mm. Yeah. I could have planned it any better. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. You use this shot. I mean... Uh, it's I'm in love with it. Beautiful. Yeah. Incredible. With, with, elephants, with elephants, the shutter noise is nice. They, they come to see what the shutter noise is. They come and look for it. Yeah. So with elephants, the shutter noise is good. With buffaloes, it's not so good. Yeah. With buffaloes, what I've learned is that every particular species of an animal has their way of reacting to the camera. Yeah. So yeah. you then work on, you say, okay, today I'm going to go and do zebras. So I'm going to go and try and work with that camera and that device, yeah? So everything with its own, yeah? Jackals, always, wow. yeah? Again, Nairobi National Park, the scene says everything, yeah? yeah? 24 millimeter, and here we go. Yeah, I have made a cage. This is <laughs> elephant proof, tested, proven, <laughs> sorted, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, so, uh, this, uh, yeah, it's a cage, it is an iron cage, you say it's elephant proof. Um, but um, have have you got into a situation where they, they really kicked it as if they're playing football with it? Yes, I have. And I have a photo. It should be on my Instagram where there is the elephant above, like it's trying to pick up uh, my Land Rover. Yeah, so you just see the trunk and you can yeah. see it's trying to pick up the Land Rover. So it's there on my Instagram. Yeah, yeah, it's not yeah, here I, on I my... I've seen that. I remember having seen that. Yeah. 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 That That is exactly that. They kicked, 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 kicked until I got that shot. Literally and, like a ball. And camera with, with 
withstood all that uh, impact? It's still working. My <laughs> insurance company is very happy with me. I can just say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so in this one now I use my twenty millimeter f one point eight. Wow! Oh, oh. But, yeah, but the, this is what I was asking. Sorry, uh, this yes. is what I was asking. Um, why not with the wheels? Why not with wheels? Um, with elephants, it's they don't like that movement. Okay. Yeah. Elephants don't. So put it this way: lions, no problem. Uh, buffaloes, no problem. Uh, other sort of zebras, they don't like that thing moving towards them. Yeah? Right. Elephants, again, don't like something moving towards them like that. So elephants also don't like that. So, you know, it's every subject has its different reaction. So you don't end up with one device, you end up with so many devices to try and get it to work. But then you are kind of stuck because you have to pre-plan the shoots, right? Absolutely. So all this, imagine now, not only have I got this thing to the skill of releasing the shutter at the right time, but trying to work out, and this is what the next slide is about, is where do you place it? You know, how do you know where to place the camera? Hmm. Look at that. You know, where is this wildebeest going to go? One thing I guarantee you, he will follow one of those paths. You can see the paths on the screen, yeah? Yeah. That those are paths they use. He'll never go to a unless he's running from a lion. Then maybe he'll go to another path. But he will always use the path. And nine out of ten times, the path is facing. So you can see he's facing slightly to the right, and he will go down that path. So you go plan ahead, put the camera down on that path, and then move away. Because if you are on that path, he will never come towards you. Yeah, okay. you need to be far away from there. Because as soon as he sees, okay, you, if let's say you put the camera down one of the paths, go and stand on the other path, that means you're kind of telling him that, no, that's the path you want to go down to. Yeah. Without trying to push him and force him. Because as soon as you try and force one of these animals, all they'll do is they'll turn around and run in the opposite direction. Because don't forget their DNA or their de mental design has been lions force them to one direction where there's a trap waiting and the other one grabs. You know what I mean? So when you yeah. try and push them towards one direction, they never go. They mm -hmm. never, ever go in that direction. They always go in the opposite. So unless you know how to target that, I think lines would have been amazing. So no one has been able to, we, I don't know. I haven't put that much effort. I put my effort in, I want a peaceful, I want a beautiful shot. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, yeah. talking about approach. Yeah. 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 There, you, there are you, a couple of questions uh, on YouTube, I think, which we can ask here. Uh, sure. by Yogesh Bhatia is saying, as per your niche area is ground level shots with cage camera or a device similar to that. First is, is it allowed for everyone to um, to, uh, to do that or you have taken special permissions? And, uh, again? Yeah. So sorry, go on, go on, finish the question and then I'll ask. Is it not risky to place and recover it back? Uh, very simple. Again, go into a conservancy, let them know up front. Yeah, that this is what I've come to do. They'll say yes or no, or you then choose another conservancy who allows it. Um, dangerous dropping it and picking it up. You're not really going to go two kilometers, place it and walk back two kilometers. You're going to drive your vehicle to the point. I even drop it without coming out of the vehicle because it's always in the heat of the moment. You know, oh, look. Uh, wildebeest is walking in that or buffalo is walking in that direction let's go and place the camera ahead in that direction so you go far ahead put the camera without even leaving so the buffalo doesn't see you leaving it just sees a car driving you know what i mean yeah you put the camera down you prepare it in the vehicle you drop it down you drive off and then once you've driven off then it's down to your luck and your planning did it work out yeah these are not plans where I leave the camera for five days hoping that it'll work. No, these are where I can see the animal is approaching and then I go and set up up ahead. So everything for me is quick and it must be deployed within seconds. Not I have the time to go and choose a trigger point, set it up, the animal will come here. So when the animal crosses this beam, it'll trigger and shoot. And those 
sort of shots, you'll find a very common of animal walking past sort of shot. Yeah, I wanted, I didn't want those sort of things in my photography. I wanted a different type of shot, but get as close as I could. Yeah. All right. Some, you know, emotion in the animal is important as well. Yeah. So yeah. just, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go over this slide. I know we're taking a lot of time before yes. I jump into aerial photography. This is, you know, never drive directly to an animal because as soon as you do that, it looks at you as you're coming to confront it. So it goes away. Always choose, look at the way the road is, you know, look at the way I've drawn it. It's going round, not straight up. Yeah. And if the animal is walking, why don't you either wait for it to come to you or go to a position where the animal will take its time, 10, 20 minutes, but it'll come in your direction. And in that way, the animal will even, you know, it'll come so close that you will be surprised that this one's scared of you. Yeah. Uh, another thing is, which I take very importantly, I'm just going to run through them and then I'm going to just go over a brief summary is, you know, we're going to nature. Please respect that. Nature, you know, go and respect that you're in nature. Don't disturb the animals. Take a professional guide who will be sure of what you're doing rather than trying to, you know, disturb the animals. A professional guide will instantly tell you, saying, hey, hey, hey we're disturbing the animals. No. Yeah. Uh, don't go for these sort of guides who are happy to do anything for money. They don't have this sort of factor of, no, we need to. You know, if the animals are not there or we, dis we disturb them so they run away, what are we going to photograph? So we need to make sure we take care of these animals. Uh, and if we don't take care of them, who else is going to? We as the photographers need to put that effort in when go and look after these animals. You know, uh, research your subject. As I was telling you, read that book on uh, elephants. And I'm honest, your opinion will elephants will change straight away. Uh, leave food at the lodge. I know we take lunch out, but you know, when we go there on a picnic site, we leave a mess behind sometimes. Please clean up. Don't, you know, some guys will go around trying to feed the birds. Then you find that you go to a picnic site and there's all these birds, they're waiting for you to come. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get food. Somebody's come, you know, try and move away from all of that sort of stuff. Let's go and respect what we're going there to do. We're going there for the wildlife. Let's respect them. Yeah. And my la second last after aerial photography, we'll go into talking about editing. Yeah, and yeah. this is wow. Oh my god, Gadi. yeah. You know, in this case, I haven't shown it, but I would underexpose by maybe about two stops to try and get that darkness in the water. Yeah, that is, yeah. Um, aerial photography, I, I have a question. Uh, um, I don't know whether you are going to tackle it during your presentation. So do so. Sure, go go ask it, yes. Yeah. So do you use drones or do you use helicopter or do you use uh, the balloon ride? So I don't know. These three probably I could think of. Cool. So what I'll do is towards the end of it, once I've shown you what I'm using, we'll tackle yeah. it at that yeah, point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so so this on this particular scene, what's happening is because of the heavy rain, the silt is coming and mixing with the river and flowing in and it's creating these beautiful lines. And, you know, no, no, for, for me, no landscape is complete without an animal in it. You can see the flamingos flying across. Yeah. Uh, in this case, you can see the zebras running yeah. across. Yeah. I love to, you know, I, I never go on saying, okay, look, let's go in the middle of the day. I'll always say long amazing. shadows. Long shadows are really important for me. Yeah. Uh, you, you can see in this case, we've got the shadow of the device right in the middle of the photo. Here. <laughs> so yeah. you kind of get a hint of yeah. the device here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but again, you know, um, you can see because the water level has dropped, the algae content in each of the pools is different, giving you the different colors in, 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 the, in the little pools. Every pool has a different color. Yeah. It, sometimes you find crocs in particular pools. It's, it's this this place is just the most phenomenal place I've been to, to be honest with you. Here we go, wildebeest running across, yeah, overexposed, so I can get the background to go all bright enough in black and white. I take the brights even brighter, they become white, you know what I mean? One flamingo coming across. This is um, the mine soda ash from this lake, the stuff that makes glass bottles, um, they mine it in this lake, and here you go, one flamingo in the dry season, 
in the wet season, we have the lines coming across. In the dry season, it cracks up and it looks like marble. Yeah. Here's a scene from Amboseli. We've got the elephants drinking at the swamp at the end, underexposed, so the water becomes black. But we've got the elephants with, you, you know, vertically above something different. You know, you don't get to mm -hmm. see this every day. And I, even as much as I photograph, I don't get to see it. My favorite. Oh my God. Absolutely my favorite shot. This is, uh, the green is the algae that the flamingos come and eat. This is the reason the flamingos come. They come to eat this algae. And you've got the flamingos flying across the scene and underexposed shot. So the dark water has gone even more darker. And I'll, this is my favorite, favorite shot of up there. Yeah, it's, it's literally like something from outer space. Yeah, if I had a little green, a very bluish ball in the middle, that probably looked like the Earth. Yeah, but yeah. Where is this taken? Okay. Uh, Lake Magadi. Yeah. Okay. It's about uh, two and a half hours by road from Nairobi. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, so so here, here we go. We've got all these flamingos in dark water where they're walking. They're disturbing the water, which is creating those lines. Okay. It's just, you know, I'm still lost for words when I fly over this place, yeah? Again, look at the colors. There's purples, there's oranges, there's blues. It's so beautiful, yeah? So, so beautiful, yeah? This is a shot by my son, not even by me, yeah? So I was on the 2470. He was, sorry, I was on the 70 to 200. He was on the 2470. He was nine years old at this time. When he took this shot, he was nine. Oh, incredible. And, yeah, it's, just, it's just showing you that, you know, concentrate on the scene. Don't concentrate on camera settings too much. Yeah. Look at this with the flamingos running across. You know, it, it literally looks like plants or something. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think thousands of flamingos, clear waters. Yeah, a reflective skies, one hill in the background. Yeah. And if 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 my device has now not become obvious, I think it should uh, yeah. be now. <laughs> got it, got it. Yeah. Oh, I see a dragon. That's why I didn't want to spoil it at start, yeah. No, no, that's a dragonfly actually. Yeah, fair enough. Let's go for dragonfly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the lines created, it kind of looks like they're coming for the chopper in this case. Yeah, so it's like, I, I, I think I even captioned this heat seeking missiles, yeah? heat seeking <laughs> flamingo missiles. Yeah? Patriot missiles. <laughs> yeah, and here's the device. Yeah, so this is oh. how we flew. So it's just a, a slightly larger drone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so uh, um, one, one thought that, um, you 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 using a helicopter here. So, um, are drones um, prohibited there? Number one. Um, it, it, go on. Yeah, finish. Go on. You, yeah, and sorry. second, if if they are not, then will they not become um, better or easy equipment to shoot with instead and and cheaper one as well? Um, so, just take us through. Totally that. agree. Totally agree with you. I don't think, unless you're putting a drone with an SLR on it, I don't think that no. quality has got there yet. Yeah, so, yeah? Yeah. yeah. so that's, I think, the biggest lag. Until yeah. you're not getting one of these quad, quad or eight fan ones and then you're sticking a SLR on it, I still think they're coming. Believe me, they're coming, but they haven't got there. And then the added factor, you, you know, the adrenaline rush of flying in a helicopter is much much better than us right yeah but again you know drones yes they're getting there slowly by slowly um we even take the doors off on the chopper this is up in the dunes in northern kenya i'm flying with if you've not heard of is thomas vidian he's a nikon ambassador for middle east Why? yeah okay. yeah so i was flying with him in this case so again you know with this stuff as you said drones i don't think they've got there helicopters have a lot of vibration uh i use high shutter speeds to work on that the, uh, vibration. We've got a lot of wind from the blades. So I use, try and use uh, 7200s rather than my 200, 400. I've tried with the 200, 400. It, it, it's never really, it, it's too big. 
yeah, and cumbersome to try and use. Uh, we take the doors off, so make sure straps are used. The last thing you want to do is a camera flying out because that's gone. And the biggest risk with helicopter trials is air sickness because when he's flying around and he's throwing the helicopter around, I think nearly everyone I've flown with minus two or three people haven't thrown up. Everyone has to use one of those bags. Huh? So that's a key one with uh, air, with helicopter stuff. Um, going into it, I'm waiting for this slide. Uh, talking about photos, you know, yeah. a lot of questions, we only hear with four of us, but, you know, I've gone into workshops with Nikon in many countries and we go and ask and say, what makes an image and what draws you in? And because we are all photographers, we forget that public also view our images. And the first thing that happens is the guy will always say is, oh, sharpness is very important. And I was like, honestly, you think Joe Bloggs out there looks at a camera or looks at a photo and the first thing he says is, oh, but it's out of focus. There's art in it, yeah? It doesn't matter if it's out of focus sometimes. So I always say is that we need to concentrate on composition. That's the first thing that all of us will look at before we get into, you know, what draws you into the image. I believe it's composition. And then the subject, you know, how has the whole scene come together? And the details in the photo are far down. You know, us guys as photographers, the first thing we go and look at another photographer's work and say, this guy focus, the focus point was wrong. Ah, this sharpness was poor, you know, that's what we go and look at. The public doesn't see that, you know, when I go to some of my friends and say, oh, that photographer's photo was really good. Yeah, I liked it, but it was out of focus. I didn't notice. I'm sure many of you have heard that. Forget about, yeah, it's nice to be technically correct, but this is an art. Let's get this art right. Yeah. yeah. And here is talking about the art, cheetah, reflection. This is the real shot. This is what I took. Wow. And I turned it upside down to get that. And eventually it got to this by cropping. But you know what I'm trying to say is it's an art. You know, when you're in this scene, 99, I would have chosen initially, I've, and I've had misses on this. I would have chosen the focus point as the cheetah itself. But in this case, I chose the focus point to be the reflection. Yeah, I, just because I, 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 I saw I wanted to do this at that time. That's great. But I was listening to, I don't remember which one, but um, because I've been listening to your wherever interviews and reading, whatever I could. Um, yeah. There is some story behind this cheetah, some interesting story behind this particular cheetah. Uh, that, that, um, that, that, uh, um, that the lion and, and the cheetah and the prey that... Oh, no, no, no. I don't, it, it, it's nothing as dramatic as that. It, they were simply early morning, they... These guys, uh, you know, hunts are never successful or there's a very small proportion. So they were walking. It was first thing in the morning. They were looking for prey. Uh, they were avoiding lions as cheetahs will always do, avoid hyenas and lions. If they come, they go in the other direction. I'm not sure of the story you've heard. It might have been over dramatized, but it was literally just a scene. We were following the cheetahs around. We saw this water. The guide came across and said, they're going to drink water, prepare your camera. He went and put us in the right position. It was definitely down to the guide. And we got the shot or got the shot with the cheetahs and the reflection. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So again, talking about settings, you know, beautiful shot. I used this for Valentine's one, one year. I posted this on Valentine's. It did super well. You know, the sun's setting. You've got a male and a female. She's kind of looking shy, the body language that she's trying to give. You know, then I talk to guys and I say, okay, let's talk about EXIF. You know, let's talk about settings. Let's talk about um, aperture, F4. Yeah, it could have been better if it was a deeper aperture. F4 was the aperture I used. Uh, ISO 100, sure, I could have gone more sensitive, but I wanted to go... Uh, should I say, um, I didn't want detail on the subjects themselves. I just wanted the sky detail to come in. And then look at the shutter speed, one eight thousandth of a second. And to be honest with you, I was photographing a wildebeest with a beautiful sky landscape type far away. And I was getting these beautiful 
pink colors in the sky, nice horizon. And I was busy photographing that wildebeest. And the guide said, look, let's go like everyone. Of, I've heard of some lions on the radio. Let's go to the other side of the park. Or let's go close by. We've got some lions. And all I did was I picked up the camera. I put it down. Like everyone else, you forget what was your last setting. You don't bring it back to standard and say, let's put it back to where we don't know what the next shot is going to be. So we left it. I got to that scene, got there. This was happening. I had no choice. I picked up the camera. I took a shot. I took maybe about two or three shots. And even before I could think about camera settings, the scene was gone. Yeah. The, lion had, the lioness had gone. The lion had moved. It was a bush where I could only get this between the two bushes. The, the scene was gone, but I got the shot. You know, a post process got it to where I love it, to a way I liked it. You know, so don't worry about it. Your cameras, you know, a D5, you're spending a lot of money because that thing is clever. You know, the electronics in it are so good that it'll save you, I think, Half the time, the camera saves me. You know, it's not about me and my photograph. It's about the camera saving my, my backside. <laughs> but, you know, talking about composition. Here is the original shot. Here is the edited and completed shot. The story on the edited shot is so much more dramatic than the original. It's just showing you behind the scene. Black and white does justice to it. And, you know... The drama, you know, the one eye rather than both the eyes, you know, that one eye, the side that was angry compared to the side that wasn't angry. Yeah, it brings the scene together. That's, you know, it's all about composition. Think about how you want the shot, how you want the shot to end. Yeah, not all the time I can take this edited shot in camera because maybe the line wasn't close enough, 400 millimeter wasn't enough. I, I can't sit there and say, okay, you know, we, we all have a budget on equipment. You can't go there and say, hiya, we've got, this scene must be a 600 millimeter. This scene must be 24. It doesn't always come. Sometimes I'll take this shot with a 600 or this shot with, sorry, with a 400, this shot with a 2470 as well. So when you come home, you can work on it because those screens are small. You don't really get to see exactly what you'd see on a big screen. So look at it in all directions. A very simple, increase your highlights, reduce your shadows. Mm. We'll get you this. Think about the shots you've taken. You know, that's all this has done is increase your height, maximize your highlights, uh, completely darken your shadows. You know what I mean? Brighten your highlights, darken your shadows. Mm. You might get a few hot spots that remain. There's nothing stopping you from taking the brush too loud and just changing, dropping those hot spots. You haven't gone and changed the scene the scene is still there the leopard is still the same leopard coming down the tree you know a lot of us photographers have oh no we must not change the scene it's fine art this is art you put this how you want to put it it's your view you know there's a lot of photographers there who do only fine art look at the amount of followers on them i bet you they've got tens or hundreds of thousands yeah it's however i don't say it's about followers i always will say it's not about followers it's about showing your art you like something do it how you like it post it don't go running for the money shot because when you're running for the money shot what will eventually happen is when you go into the park you're not enjoying it you're going there because you want that money shot Go there, enjoy the wild, enjoy the scene, and the shots will come. Honestly. Right. Right. Yeah? <clears throat> Just simple edit. You know, this is only Lightroom. You know, let's darken black and white. It all works. You know, mm. just simple stuff. Yeah? And thank you very much. Yeah? Appreciate it. Yeah? And please, go ahead and uh, follow me. I know a lot of... Thank you, since you guys have posted it up on Facebook, I've had a lot of friend requests. I'm sitting at 5,000, so I can't accept any more. But please, Instagram's there. Go and check out my website. You can follow me on Facebook. And when I do get spaces, people leave. I think people are walking away from Facebook these days. They're moving more towards Instagram. So 
if when I do get spaces on Facebook, I'll definitely definitely add you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to me. I know sometimes I could be boring. Yeah. And oh, just so so amazing and thank you so much, guys. Yeah, it was such an amazing session. Yeah. Yeah. There was not a dull moment. Not one dull moment. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'm going to take the screen off. Yeah. Go. So um, yeah. thank you, Gurj. It was such a wonderful session. And uh, all those um, that you showed in the last slide, they I've already put in the description. So guys, if you want specific links to his website, your Facebook and his Instagram, they are there in the description. The links are there. You can just click on that link and go there and follow and uh, get inspired by his, his wonderful work. Yeah. Um, so yeah. um, I have a few questions. Anybody, anybody from the panel would um, want uh, to yeah, ask? I am actually curious. Um, last time when I was there in 2014, that time Malaika gave birth of seven cubs. I heard yeah. one or two died. Are those are those are the cubs which are right now moving around? Mm, you know, uh, on cheetahs, if you told me five of them survived, I wouldn't believe you. It's very, very unlikely. She'll be very lucky to make two out of that, three maximum. But to adulthood, maybe just two. Yeah. So yes, they are still Malaika's cubs, or should I say now her children are still out there in the park. Yes. Nice. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of guys who follow to that detail of this is so-and-so, son of so-and-so, daughter of so-and-so, and she was daughter of so-and-so. Yes. There is, and a lot of people follow that history, and there are, I think, a lot of Facebook groups that also do that. So, yeah, by all means, please do follow, and you'll find them there. I, I'll be very, very honest with you. Um, I went, initially, when I was getting into photography, I did a lot of that, but then I got to a point where, you know, as you say, I, I started thinking about settings. I started thinking about which animal. And then rather than trying to get the art in the shot, I would then go and say, no, 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 no. I want that particular lion. I want that particular cheetah. So I've stopped doing all of that. I don't care which cheetah, which lion, male lion. Wow. I want a male lion on this dramatic scene. It doesn't bother me who the particular animal is. It's about getting the shot right. That's, Absolutely. you know, it's about art. Yeah. True, true. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. There is, there is one particular question from Yogesh on, on YouTube, and I think I would like to link my question to that, um, is that we are going through this very challenging situation, COVID-19, and uh, the travel is banned. So how is the situation at your side? Um, are parks yet still open now and uh, people are start coming in or no? Um, how... Kenya's lockdown has been is we've had a lockdown in the city. So we haven't been told, go and sit at home and don't leave and only go out for groceries. So our lockdown has been, so they're trying to keep the economy growing at the, or working at the same time. So we are told that, okay, Nairobi is a hotspot with COVID. So we are going to stay, we're going to close Nairobi's border. So you cannot leave Nairobi. I cannot leave Nairobi unless I have special permission and a valid reason to travel. Yeah, so the guys who are stuck in the Mara, bloody lucky, they can carry on in the Mara. Uh, thankfully, Nairobi National Park is within Nairobi's limits, so I can still attend Nairobi National Park at my leisure. Yeah, and if you are out of Nairobi and you don't have to cross Nairobi to get to Masai Mara, you can still go to Masai Mara. Yes, all the parks are open. The only trouble is you can't get into the country, and I can't leave Nairobi to get to Masai Mara for example. Yeah. So if I was stuck outside of Nairobi on the right side of going towards Masai Mara, trust me, I would have been Masai Mara all the time. Yeah. But I'm not. But you make do with what you have close to you. And, you know, uh, as much as I'm not, and I don't encourage going to zoos because we are giving money to people who are capturing or bringing animals to lockdown. You know, that sort of thing I'm not into. But if that's the only thing you have around you, please go ahead. You enjoy doing animal photography. Go and do that. Go to the parks. You walk. You might find a squirrel. You know, in India, I believe they walk around live on the trees in the neighborhoods as well. Go and try that. You know, uh, parrots are quite a big thing in India as well. And a lot of birds. So go for those birds. You know, try that. You know, don't get...
stuck on, I know a lot of um, photographers live in other countries and are stuck on African wildlife and they cannot get their wildlife fixed until they come to Africa. But the biggest thing I feel with those sort of photographers is you don't use your camera, you don't get practice. So please, wherever you are, make sure you are practicing regularly. So, so when you get that camera in your hand, you close your eyes and you know where every function is. You know where this button, where it feels. Because nine out of 10 times you want to be your eye on the viewfinder. You need to change a setting. You don't pick your eye off. You change it while you're on the viewfinder. And Nikon did that very well with their D5 onwards. They even put the ISO button up there. So you never have to use a second hand to receive. You're always holding the lens and you're photographing as a wildlife photograph it's such an amazing thing you know all your buttons are at that finger where you need to trigger and it's faster you don't need to lift your hands off the camera or the lens so that's the sort of thing you know it's practice you need that practice you need to understand your camera you need to know that if i go above 1500 2000 10000 iso what's going to happen you need to know that you need to know in this situation where the a subject is two meters from me, 10,000 ISO is not a problem. But if the subject is 100 meters from you, 10,000 ISO is a big issue. Those are the things you need to understand before. And a lot of them also happen while you're photographing. That's the beauty about it. You learn as you move. You can't be an expert and then go. Yeah, we, we learn on the job sometimes, yeah? <laughs> I'm reading the in the chat, internal chat as well. Huh? So Prakash, where is he? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true. So I, I have jotted down a few questions for you and, and I think sure. that will be sure. very important for the uh, listener, viewers out there as well. Um, is that, is it, how, how important it is to study animal behavior for a good wildlife uh, image to be created? Is it really important or you can still somehow manage with your luck? You can absolutely manage with your luck. You know, it's all about luck. That's the first priority. But what, if you understand the animal's behavior, you know what's going to happen next. And it prepares you for that next. That's the big thing. You know, like uh, we, we get bee eaters. Yeah, bee eaters would fly off but come back to the same branch at the same mm. spot. Yeah, yeah. If you don't know that, when the bee eaters flown off, you put your camera away and say, let's go. Yeah, yeah. Job done. But if you'd understand that, you'll spend that extra five minutes waiting for that bee eater to come back and you get the shot of it coming to land. Right. That is what I'm talking about. You know, you know that if a lion has yawned once, it's going to yawn another two times. It's going to yawn three times in a row, if not more. You know, so if you missed one, it's okay. Prepare your camera. Second one is coming very soon. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. You know, like, okay, a lion has made a kill and it's had the kill for two days. You know, as if you understand their behavior, you know that the next thing the lion is going to go into is go and look for water to drink. So, you know, it's there, you find the nearest water hole, you go and wait by the water hole. That lion, I guarantee you, will come and drink water. Mm -hmm. you, you know yeah. what I mean? Those are the, that's, that's the understanding that will give you the advantage on the shot. Not give you the shot, give you the advantage in preparing for the shot. All right. Yeah. That, that's, that's very interesting. There is, there is one question from Sarita on YouTube that near the water holes, do different animals go at different times? Ever got different animals together at a water hole? Uh, they all have an itinerary which is written on the board. So at 10.25, <laughs> zebras are going to come. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for making a joke about it. No, yes, you get to see everybody at a water hole. But um, you, you tend to find that uh, herbivores will tend to mix. And, you know, it's about safety in numbers. So you'll find giraffes, zebras, uh, wildebeest will gather together. But then you find someone like buffaloes, which are still herbivores, but buffaloes won't mix with zebras because they're very aggressive. They push zebras, elephants, they push everything away. So you, it is dependent on the type of animals that are there. So, yeah, for sure, you'll find um, impalas, zebras, giraffes, they'll hang around together. 
but as I said, Buffalo's won't, yeah. But I'm, I, I'll put up the itinerary so on the wall, so you know who's okay. coming at what time. So, so <laughs> if, I, if I understand you right, then if the buffaloes are at the water hole and zebras and impalas are approaching, they will wait, they will stop and probably wait for the um, buffaloes to go. Yes. Before they. 100% correct, yes. Okay. And if. And if the zebras and impalas are already at the water hole, the yeah. buffaloes aren't going to wait. The buffaloes are going to come and push them off. And yeah, okay. So th then these okay. guys will go up and then probably... Yeah. Or, and or, the buffaloes will come and take over. It won't even be... You'll just see the buffaloes will just come and the other guys will all disappear. But then uh, if even the birds will fly off, yeah? But then, you know, if the zebras are coming in and the giraffes, the birds will just stay in the middle of the water uh, the zebras will come and drink. The giraffes will carry on. You know, for those guys, it's safety in numbers. And, you know, having a giraffe at a waterhole is an advantage because the giraffe can see at a longer distance. You, you know, and zebras have also good hearing and good eyesight. And they all work together like that. So herbivores tend to hang around together. Yeah. A rhino comes. Rhinos are calmer, but rhinos are sensitive. So they'll wait for everyone else to leave before the rhino comes. He wouldn't sort of, you know, come and maybe push or push his weight around or something. So everyone has their way of working. Yeah. But you do see them together. Yes. Uh, even sometimes lions are there drinking together. Uh, I have seen photos. Sometimes I used to think it's photoshopped, but I have seen photos of desert areas in Namibia or that sort of place where there's a water hole and it's a big water hole and everyone is sort of within the area drinking together. Yeah. Yeah. It does happen. Yeah. There, there is no law that this exactly. will guaranteed never happen. Yeah. There is no law like that. Yeah. There's another interesting question uh, from Chintan Gohel. Um, I think he's from Africa. First, he asked also about uh, if you can give some input on the insurance thing for the Kenyan guys and African, uh, somebody who's, who can get it done. But the second question is very interesting and I wanted to ask that too, that we've seen you pushing new grounds with aerial and ground photography. What next? It's just, you know, tomorrow I might wake up and this idea comes. So that life. idea will be the one, the drive. The idea will be the drive as long as it includes wildlife. Yeah, as, as I said, rule of thumb is it must have a tail. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I just had a, a thought. Um, now you, you have this camera cage, um, but, but I, I've not seen this um, earlier. What I've seen is um, people using with some kind of uh, casing. Um, so if, if that is what you want to do ahead in future, uh, have you ever thought of creating similar kind of casing, which is almost like a waterproof thing also, so that you can really go under the water or even at the surface of the water and try and create something totally different, which is going to give you uh, another website, on your website, another heading that sub-water. Underwater, underwater wildlife. No, no, I, I want to stop him because what he's doing is he's already talking about my future projects in the reason that the waterproof housing has been got. I've already made the balance and I'm working on half-submerged shots. Yeah, and I'm just trying to, now I'm trying to study crocodiles and trying to study hippos and see what's the best location, the best timing. So yes, that is in progress. It is something I am working on as we speak. Uh, I do own a buggy, which you put. I have a, uh, the best camera that works on the buggy is the Z7 because of how light it is. Uh, I'm currently also working on how to protect the camera inside. So I wanted to go and do lion shots with that. Uh, the last time I used my buggy in the Mara, I got 20 shots and pieces of a buggy, thanks to a lion. Yeah, so now, now I'm trying to work on the next stage. Uh, at the same time, I've also got um, ways of trying to uh, hide the camera better. So, you know, trying to do different paintings, make it look like uh, tortoise, make it look like grass. So those are also... So whilst it's not one project at a time, it's about four or five things happening at the same time. Ah, um, yeah, you know, this, it, the, the mind is constantly working. 
uh, helicopter trips are also, you know, okay, how is the season in Magadi? The flamingos are now coming into season. I need to do, this is the time for helicopter. This is the time for aerial. You know, it, it, it's a constant. And, you know, um, I, uh, unfortunately, due to COVID, I was not able to. I was booked. I pre-planned the trip to Solio Ranch again, where I do my rhino, uh, crazy rhino shots. That was also in the plan. It still is in the plan. So, you know, it's not that I like to keep my life flowing and interesting. So if you're constantly doing the same thing, that means that the fresh shots I've got are the same type of shot. You know what I mean? Because, look, uh, if you're saying the underwater, let's get a shot with a croc, how many variations of that shot with the croc are you going to get? You might get five beautiful wow and that's it. Move on to trying to get something new. But the time will, ha what happens is, okay, I've got the croc shot. Now I can't leave or, or I can't sit quietly for the next six months to try and now sit there and trying to, for six months, I have no shots to post. So there's a constant rotation of shots that's happening and the momentum is constantly there. But yes, I want to get that croc shot one day. And maybe I sometimes think, should I be one of those photographers who goes quiet for six months? You don't hear anything. And then he comes back six months later with these crazy shots again. And then again, he goes quiet for six months. But I think that is social media suicide as well at the same time. Yeah. So uh, what the plan at the moment is, is next year, I shall definitely be coming out with a coffee table book. Uh, the shots, I think I have enough shots to put maybe a 200, 300 page book. Um, the, what is the work, the way it needs to go is I need to do the write-ups, find a nice writer who can put them in very beautiful English that, you know, keeps things flowing, makes it artistic, which matches the shots art. You know what I mean? Not something over dramatic which is talking about like you said on the cheetah shot there's a big story behind it i don't want to make up these stories i want it to be honest clear what i've done how it's done talk about the shots talk about the gear talk about how i got the shot you know something like that not a tutorial but something that you put on your coffee table and say have you seen this guy's work you know I see a lot of photographers and I see their work and that's inspiration for me to go and get those shots. And I hope that this work is inspiration for you guys or other guys who are watching or will watch this in the future to go out and get these shots. It's not going to be, we like to watch a lot of technical reviews on cameras and technical this and technical that and this camera's ISO is crazy. And you know, I pick up a, cam a brand new camera, I take it out of the box, I make sure I put the, uh, the the lines in the viewfinder, whatever they're called, I put it on shutter priority, I put on ISO automatic, um, I'll see my exposure compensation, I'll see where my focus points are, and I'm out in the field with it. I don't sit there and go and study on Nikon's website and that one's review and that one, because this camera's speciality is that. No, it, this this is the camera speciality. If you can see, this is this is the reason that camera is working, and this is where it needs to work. And this eye is what gets the shot. So that is priority. The rest is all secondary. Yeah. That's, that's that's what I want to get into everybody. That's, that's really such a wonderful. That's very inspiring. Very inspiring. Very yeah, very, that's very inspiring. Um, uh, we have already spent two hours, but. I am I'm really greedy, so <laughs> no problem. Just one more question is that um, uh, actually two. One is very small that you are very near to Mara. Three and a half hours is just being there, but I have not seen any river crossing or migration images in your portfolio. So any particular reason for that? Exactly, one hundred percent. The reason is that. I like to do my photography in peace and quiet. Not because the river is noisy. It is the other 200 vehicles that are there in the migration. I hate that. I totally dis get disgusted. And you end up there going fighting with other photographers and trying to get shots you love. 
and those scenes when you look back at those shots be like you remember yeah there was that other vehicle that was really pissing me off and that guy did this and i said that to him no and this year i'm hoping i'm sorry i'm hoping that our international lockdown is still on but our local lo- lockdown opens and then i will go and get yeah, my yes, river crossing well. so we will be lucky to see something very very different coming from your your yeah. land your yeah country. actually this year it will be totally different it is august right in one and a half two month and it should june it usually starts by june yeah june, by june yeah, they june start coming august. in yes Okay. the place will be totally empty that's Andy. what i'm look i'm 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 sorry i'm being very selfish here but i am looking forward to that exactly yeah, absolutely this, wow. we need yeah, to be and i've already told a couple of lodge owners who are friends of mine i've said to them i'd love to, you know uh, 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 what i find a lot of times is happening is uh, lodges come to me and say give us some photos for marketing and i'll be like not a problem but i want some stays in return because if i don't gather these photos what am i going to give you so i want photos in return i want uh, i want accommodation for me to go out and get these photos in return so the other day i had a good friend of mine he said good i've got this new lodge in the mara i want you to come to it and please advertise for us on social media as i like, i don't mind i'll go there i'll go to the lodge i'll get something done for you but um you have to tell me when the migration is on when the wildebeest are coming call me i will come yeah give me a driver and i'm looking forward to this year it's going to be very quiet uh, i have also managed to find a way i can fly a helicopter in the mara cuz there'll not be many cars no one's going to complain so this year i think i'm looking forward to migration and aerial migration shots that probably awesome. have been captured fantastic that is interesting already yeah. looking forward more than yeah. you we so are please please please, please be careful we don't ask me these questions of what i am doing for the future <laughs> let's keep surprises <laughs> coming open some everything <laughs> <laughs> and big secret there another, keeper there is another question linked to this is that uh, we see lot of crowding happening um, when the lion is making a kill surrounded by 100 cars Yes. river crossing happening surrounded by 200 cars you find a cheetah um uh, the the guys guide and and the authorities are telling don't go there but everybody is trying to somehow sneak their way into that and because they want to take it, take an image uh, how ethical it is and is there a way around that we can still control and and probably because they are disturbing the ecosystem as well and uh, so so what is your take on that i know i, I am balance i totally been... agree with you and you know a lot of people look at that rhino shot which is looking like it's attacking the camera and saying oh this guy is disturbing animals yeah but here i've been able to tell my story and i tell you the story behind the shot yeah and what i'm doing so that i don't scare the animals but i'm 100% with you and the reason i haven't got migration shots is exactly that I don't want to be around 200 vehicles. Um I'm totally with you. I have this discussion with a lot of photographers and we believe in person that the Mara is not being spoiled by the people coming in. It's being spoiled by the photographers coming in because yes. the people who are there don't mind being 10 meters, 20 meters. They want to see. They don't mind, you know, they're enjoying the whole scene and they're watching what's going on. But the photographers want to be in there with that 600 mm i want to get this nasal hair photography i want to go and get you know every whisker on that animal and we are the ones or we are the photographers that are spoiling the mara we are pushing so hard into trying to get closer and oh i want that action shot and i must get it and i don't care how i'm getting it driver i want you in there and the eco the, the system or should i say it's become so bad that now the drivers or the guides push hard to get that shot cuz they know the tip is going to be big at the end yeah and we've discussed internally with a couple of photographers saying what can we do to do it and you know the first thing we look at it and say is the minute we go and start saying don't get too close the first finger that's going to be pointed is at me saying but you're the one who gets all these super close shots and my idea of the reason why all this low level photography came in is that i don't want 
to be forcing the animal to go closer. I want the animal to come naturally to the camera. And the idea is that I'm not in the place and it becomes remote. But then you have this other sort of thing is oh, remote photography is not real photography. It doesn't matter. Look, for me, it's art and I'm working with art. So this is my way of getting my art. You like oil paints, you like water paints, that's your business. But you do, and if you make it beautiful, beautiful for you. Um, Botswana have a very good way of doing it. They have not managed to make, or they're not made their travel economic. Going into Botswana is still very expensive. And that limits the number of people going there. But it's, you know, wildlife Kenya is so beautiful. It's so economic. It helps the people who, you know, all the lodges, all the guys who work there, it really helps them. So is it wrong to bring more people in? But the ethics of it is becoming very, very complicated in the Mara. And Mara is being or is the worst about it. You go to these slightly more expensive places that on the, you know, the, the conservancies will have maximum five vehicles on a sighting. If there are more than five, everyone stays away. After 10 minutes, one car leaves, the next car comes in. 10 minutes later, if you've spent 10 minutes there, you leave, the next car comes in. Again, as photographers, we want, I personally want to spend hours. I could spend all day with a pride of lions, all day with elephants. So how I do it is I go into areas which are less busy. So what I'm trying to say is let's spread along. Kenya is not only about the Mara. Kenya has, you know, Mara is only a concentration of wildlife. Kenya has wildlife roaming everywhere. Yeah. Obviously, Mara makes it easier. Samburu is amazing. Solio, Lakipia has so much. Alpajeta, Lewa. You, you know, there's so much we have. Northern Kenya is really amazing. It was, it's just try and go everywhere. Being a photographer, try and do different things. Don't get stuck with the same. But the answer, I don't have a solution for it. If I have a solution, I'd be singing along that this is a solution. And I think the solution has to be in many different aspects rather than just one aspect, making them more expensive, trying to, un you know, maybe guide training saying, come on guys, you know, but I think the biggest issue is money and people are throwing money at the guide saying, you get me that shot. I'll give you this much amount of money. And this guy, you know, that money is significant to him and you say, whatever you want, boss, where do you want to go? How do you want, do you want me to get the, go get the cheetah right next to the vehicle so you can sit on it, he'll do that for you as well. Yeah, but I am seeing a lot of guides who are coming up and saying, no, no, good, we're disturbing or those people are disturbing the animals. I am not getting involved in that disturbance. Yeah, I have seen the guides because a lot of times I had to tell my guide, no, 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 back down. We're not going here. But now I'm seeing that it's coming directly from the guide saying, no, 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 we are backing down. Let's come on another day when it's quiet. Yeah. But as a tourist, it's even more difficult. Are you, do you have the availability and the funds to be there for one month? Personally, as a photographer, if you want to do a photographic safari, please, you need to come and spend minimum seven days in Amara. Two weeks is even better. Then you go along patiently, calmly. You see a sighting with 20 cars, you say, leave it. Let's go look for something else. That's the beauty in it. And that you'll enjoy more. Yeah. Any other questions you've got? Yeah, uh, no, I think uh, I'm done. And uh, thank you so much for this wonderful session. And uh, before we wind up, we can have one screenshot. So, sure. Yeah. So thumbs up, guys, and uh, smile. Yeah. Okay. That's such a nice moment. Oh, sorry. Go. Let, let's go again. I was looking at the screen. I should be looking at the camera, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just, just a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. When you're ready. Yeah. Yeah. Thumbs up. Yeah. There look. Look in front. Okay. That's wonderful. Okay. And thank you, uh, uh, thank you, you Gorsh. It, it was such a wonderful session, and uh, really love the entirety of, of the, the way you prepared the flow, you taught us about technicalities, the ethics, 
everything and those intricacies and stories behind your low level aerial shots everything and uh, hope to stay connected and uh, keep getting inspired from your wonderful shots and uh, i think uh, bye for now and uh, thanks everybody on the thank UK you so app. much thank you so much coach yeah. it was great hearing you. I, I, yeah thank you thank great you too. very much guys you know you guys made this possible thank you and thanks so much for believing in me i really appreciate it all right thank you bye bye okay bye 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 take care